Positive definiteness done, uh, radial unboundedness done, easier tests done. Now we go to decrescence. Yeah, this is the third property. Okay. Uh, a function is said to be decrescent. Again, you see this local domain and all that uh, mapping to real numbers. Yeah, th this cannot change because the same function is what is being used for analysis of this stability analysis of the system. So the domain range and image. Uh, sets cannot change. Okay, so for decrescence, you require that the function is zero at zero. Again, cannot change because no Lyapunov function is allowed to be non-zero at the equilibrium, and we assume zero to be the equilibrium. Okay, uh, for all time, and there exists a class K function such that in absolute value, this function V is dominated by the class K function. Okay, okay, just digest it that you know we have it is in a mentioned in a slightly different way. You have put in the absolute value here, yeah. Uh, we are not, which means we are not restricting somehow the v from being negative. Okay, earlier definitions like class k and so on more or less guarantee v is non negative because it is 0 at 0 and then it is dominating a class k function which is strictly increasing, it means v can never be negative. Here somehow that is being allowed, yeah. So uh, again of course it is for all time in R plus and x in Br, these things are standard. So uh, the picture looks something like this, when you draw the phi norm of x, yeah, you also draw the negative of that and your v has to lie between that. This is what the picture looks like because I mean I am just translating this into this image right here, okay, alright. Now if you go back, if we go back uh, and look at which we did not use at class L function, okay, at a class L function and uh, do you think we can actually uh, Instead of using a class k function there, okay, that is phi is class k, do you think we can characterize this uh, decrescence in terms of class L functions? Anyway, this is a question I want you to think about. So, I will put it as an exercise. Can you characterize? rise decrescence using class L function. Yeah, because there it is like, because this is also somehow uh, doing a upper bounding, right, instead of a lower bounding. It seems like it is doing a upper bounding instead of a lower bounding, right. So, the question is can you use uh, class L functions in some sense, okay, can you use class L functions to characterize decrescent functions, okay, this is a, I want you to think about it, hmm? yeah, alright, okay, let us look at some of the functions we have already considered, yeah, this was one of the functions we considered, yeah, this is a function which is positive definite. Right, because it dominates this, which is a class K function, right, right. Uh, so, but does this, is this a decrescent function? Is this a decrescent function? Can this be dominated by a class K function? So, the flip question, right. Until now for positive definiteness, you wanted this to be greater than some class K function, which it is because if T is non-negative, uh, then if T is non-negative, then this is greater than equal to norm 
x square divided by 1 plus norm x square right and that is a class k function so great it is positive definite right or you can even verify positive definiteness via the easier test the easy test right same deal no difference okay now for decrescence what do we need we need it to have some upper bound with some class k function okay so usually it is not very easy to claim something like this okay in the sense you it, it would, you would be very hard pressed to prove that there does not exist or there exists a class k function okay which dominates this function not easy because you have to test every possible class k function right matlab this is only one possible class k function with which we use we prove positive definiteness okay and so i'm asking a simple question does there exist some uh, r such that this happens okay it is rather obvious that this does not happen for any r right because if you choose give me any value of r i can push up time so that you know this this condition is violated yeah because this these conditions have to hold for all time right you can see that this condition has to hold for all time right so i can always push up time such that for this particular choice of class k function things go wrong okay but now how can you guarantee that for every possible choice of class k function things will go wrong i have just shown that for one choice of class k function things don't work out but can i just categorize this as being not decrescent or how would you claim that this is not decrescent how would you claim that this is not a decrescent function i have shown that for one choice of phi x this kind of upper bounding will not work can you say the same for every possible choice of phi x yes no think about it so so will this fail will this fail for this example for arbitrary phi x now not this specific choice because i can't say that it did not work for one choice i made so it is not decrescent no that's not true there cannot the negative of this is that there does not exist any phi x okay does not exist any phi x can you claim that this is indeed the case i'm not giving you any structure of phi x or anything like that yes absolutely absolutely it's pretty straightforward right i mean think about it you give me any phi x yeah it doesn't matter what you give me you know give me this phi x or this phi x or this phi x or whatever i mean some kind of increasing function yeah you give me any phi x or phi norm of x yeah once you your problems begin and and i'm talking about now uh, v being below this what do i want v has to be below this guy right but your problems begin once you freeze the x yeah once you freeze the x you are frozen here so for this guy you are frozen here 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 wherever i don't care where you are frozen but my v this guy is not just a function of states in this case there is another x i mean another element that i can play with it's time right so this picture is not very representative whatever value of this guy you give me the, you your k class k function is frozen that's it it's a constant as good as a constant you gave me a constant it doesn't matter how big a constant you gave me i will choose my t to be really large because this has to hold for all t the left hand side has t right hand side has no t so i will bump up my t as much as i want because i can go all the way to infinity right and then this will fail my v will actually you know if this was for t equal to uh, t1 i will make for this guy uh, for v t2 same x or v t10 same x right 
I just bump up t and I will dominate. There is no way any class k function will stand, right? Why? Because the class k function by the nature of the definition is only a function of x. Once x is frozen, the class k function evaluates to a constant. However, large this constant, I have time still to play with on the left hand side. And in this case, it is an increasing function of time. So, this is where your class L should somehow think about, you should think about. Whenever I have some increasing function of time here, some strictly increasing function of time which is in fact going to infinity, I have a problem. You cannot claim that it is class K. Sorry, class, uh, sorry, it is a, you cannot claim decrescence in this case. Okay? Because this will always dominate any class K function. No problem. Okay? So, absolutely correct. I am going to delete this, sorry. Right. Okay? Is that clear? Okay? This is not decrescent. Okay, that is what I have said. And this is fine, I mean, does not matter. I mean, what I have said here. The basic point is right hand side only function of x, left hand side increasing function of time. Even if x is constant, I am done. Cannot, this domination is not possible. Alright. Okay. Again, decrescence connect to uniform stability. Alright. Suppose I flip this thing. Hmm? Suppose I flip the example. That is now it is not an increasing function of time, but a decreasing function of time. Hmm? Life is good. Why? Now, it is definitely greater than or equal to norm x square by 2 for all t. Because as t has to be greater than or equal to 0, negative t's are not allowed. Okay. So, uh, I can't make this really large and all that. Okay. So, for non-negative t, uh, this is of course dominating norm x square by 2. Oh, sorry, this is of course being dominated by norm x square by 2. Right. So, I am done. Okay. Decrescent. Now, uh, obviously, it is not positive definite though. I hope you understand by the same argument. If you give me any class k function to compare with, I know that this is a decreasing function of time. I will keep bumping up time and I will go below your class k function. Okay? So, this can never dominate any class k function. Therefore, it is not positive definite. Okay? So, somehow one might get an impression that um, both seem mutually exclusive, right? If you have a positive definite function, you did not get decrescence. If you get got decrescence, you did not get positive definiteness, okay? Seems like there is some mutual exclusivity here, which would, but then that would mean that if you get stability, you cannot get uniformity. If you got uniformity, you cannot get stability. That seems a bit ridiculous, right? So, are there functions which are both positive definite and decrescent because that is what we need for uniform stability, right. We said that decrescence is connected to uniformity, positive definiteness connected to stability. So, unless I have both positive definiteness and decrescence, I cannot claim uniform stability. So, what are we saying? There is no uniformly stable systems in the universe. So, can you tell me if there is a function which is both positive definite and decrescent? How do you think we can get a function which is both positive definite and decrescent? I gave you an example of positive definite. I gave you an example of decrescent. Now, I want both. Time bounded function. Um, yeah, little bit more, I will say. I will say it is to be bounded on both sides. Okay. It is a function that is bounded, the time is corresponding to time bounded on both sides, which is why I had introduced this example earlier. 1 plus sin square t by 2 x square, norm x square. So, what do I know? It is greater than or equal to norm x square by 2. I already proved it for the purpose of positive definiteness, right, because sin square is lower bounded by 1. But then this is also upper bounded by 2, right. So, there is both a lower bound, greater than 0 lower bound by the way, that is important. Huh? You can't have a equal to 0 lower bound or a less than 0 lower bound. It has to be a greater than 0 lower bound. So, the lower bound was 1, upper bound is 2. So, the lower bound is this guy, upper bound is this guy. Yeah? Both sides satisfied. 
okay not so complicated actually yeah until you have the example seems complicated but not so complicated right it's both decrescent and positive definite has both the properties unfortunately we don't have any shorthand for decrescence we actually write it just like greater than 0 less than 0 unfortunately we don't have any shorthand here you have to actually write that it's decrescent okay so now this is a good function to have this lets you sort of evaluate both properties yeah okay if there was no such function it would be very funny okay okay uh, obvious just like uh, we said that uniformity uh, for time invariant systems is free just like that if your v is purely a function of states then again uniformity is sort of free yeah there is nothing to no decrescence to evaluate it is decrescent and it is positive definite because there is no time argument in this itself okay so decrescence and positive definiteness anyway sorry uh, decrescence is free yeah all right. Finally, we have the property of semi-definiteness, which is a very nice and weak property. Yeah. Uh, again, similar arguments: zero at zero, scalar valued continuous, and it just has to be greater than zero as a greater than equal to zero as a function. Okay. For all time, for all x, non-negative. That's it. So all the examples we considered, they were all semi-definite at least. Yeah t x1 square plus x2 square obviously this is to in fact positive definite also x1 square by 2 x1 square by 4 semi definite okay x1 plus x2 whole square semi definite because as functions yeah so this is also gives you a big distinction between semi definiteness and definiteness okay semi definiteness is just a property of that function it's like how you when you are plotting these functions, how you look at it, ah, it is above 0, below 0, that is it. Okay. As a function, it is positive or negative. It is just, so a non-negative valued function which is 0 at 0 is semi-definite. Okay. But when you talk about positive definiteness and negative definiteness, there is certain definiteness. All right. you, are, you are basically looking at rather special properties. Okay. These are not just basic properties. Yeah. Again, why? why one might ask why we don't like these semi definite functions okay look at uh, look at this this again think about inverse of v all our analysis when we look at proofs and so on and so forth they rely on v inverse okay now if i talk about v inverse of 0 okay in a positive definite function, when I say v inverse of 0, what comes to your mind? 0, sta 0 states. But if I look at a semi definite function, v inverse of 0 is what? Straight line. All, pos all possible infinitely many states. Again, this guy, again the y axis, right? All possible infinitely many states come to mind ridiculous right i mean the question is what is it that even i mean you can't even like talk about an equilibrium in these scenarios right how do you even talk about equilibrium if you the v inverse 0 is not a, a single point then it's the v is irrelevant or useless for as far as lyapunov theorems are concerned not to say they are useless in every context they are actually uh, also methods which can let you conclude uh, stability using just semi definiteness type properties, but not of V, of V dot. Okay. So, those are basically what are these LaSalle invariants and Barbalat's lemma and things like that. Those are methods that let you talk about uh, global or asymptotic stability when V dot is only semi definite, okay. not V. V being semi definite, still tough, again, still not impossible you can do some analysis there okay all right any questions so um we have not gone to the proof of at least we, of the lyapunov theorem we are actually going to state them now uh, but when you look at the proof all the proof for the lyapunov theorems are based on v inverses taking the inverse of the v and looking at where, what you get, which is why I made this picture, yeah, where I made this picture and said that, you know, if you take 
the inverse of this set you get exactly this set so this bounded set gives a bounded inverse but here this bounded set doesn't give a bounded inverse so that kind of problems okay they rely the proof rely on inverse of these functions okay so what is the setup for the lyapunov theorems uh, nonlinear system function of time and state uh, time from t0 to infinity usually t0 has to be greater than 0 greater than equal to 0 um, and states in a ball of radius r mapping to rn is this function f with some initial condition without loss of generality we assume that 0 is an isolated equilibrium okay f is assumed to be locally Lipschitz continuous this is for existence of unique solutions we already spoke about this in the first class itself and finally we define the notion of lead derivatives okay or directional derivatives uh, nothing complicated what you think of as v dot what comes naturally to you as the derivative of v is actually the directional derivative why we use this different notation and different uh, sort of method of talking about it is because when you write a v for example i wrote some function v like this x1 square plus x2 square all right this is such a common function all right i can use this to analyze hundreds of dynamical systems okay hundreds of dynamical systems could possibly be analyzed by the same v okay so the v itself has no connection to any dynamical system v is just a function of some states not a function of nothing to do with any dynamical system but we want to study how v evolves along the solutions of a dynamical system okay so we take its derivatives along the trajectories of a particular system and when we identify this v with trajectories of a particular system what you compute as v dot is just partial of v with respect to time plus partial of v with respect to states times ftx is the lfv is the lead derivative okay it's called the lead derivative okay is the directional derivative of v okay so this is the notation but as far as you are concerned you are just computing v dot okay all right great if there is a nice c1 function v uh, mapping time and states in a domain to real numbers uh, such that for some r positive such that it is positive definite this much assumption the highlighted assumption if you have this highlighted assumption to be satisfied then this function v is already called a candidate lyapunov function okay this is the terminology it's a candidate lyapunov function if it is a c1 function of time and states and positive definite then it is a candidate lyapunov function then in the sense of lyapunov if v dot is negative semi definite origin is stable if v dot is negative semi definite and v is decrescent then origin is uniformly stable okay so these are the first two Lyapunov theorem very simple statements I have written them in a very simple way if you go to the textbook of course there is a little bit more buff in the you know statement itself because it writes a lot of things and so on writes the system and so on and so forth but the basic statement is pretty simple you take the v evaluate the v dot of course you verify that v is positive definite otherwise it is not even a candidate Lyapunov function right so that is clearly specified here okay if it is not this then it is not a candidate Lyapunov functions you cannot use it for the Lyapunov theorems okay you can use it in other places we will talk about those examples later on but for candidate for Lyapunov stability theorems no this is essential okay and then uh, we say that system is stable if the derivative of v the way we defined it is negative semi definite only semi definiteness required and further if v was also decrescent then you have uniform stability yeah you can already see the simplicity of this result once you have a v evaluating stability is just super easy of course it's not remember nothing is easy yeah 
having such a v is also it's it's something that you try to find yeah just because you took a random candidate lyapunov function v and v dot turned out to be not negative semi definite does not mean your system is not stable hmm? it just means that you did not find a good enough v okay so this is only sufficiency condition as you can see not necessary condition yeah there is an existence necessary condition but that will not help you find the lyapunov function okay so lyapunov functions are constructed primarily by experience previous literature uh energy of the system gives you some motivation but it's still a hunt okay so this is one of the complaints most people have about nonlinear systems but this is why i love nonlinear systems because uh, it's not just you know for everything i take x transpose px and it works no it doesn't work you have to put some effort into constructing this thing and more often than not it captures some fundamental property of the system okay just like energy of the system captures a fundamental property of the system okay so if you have a lagrange system then energy remains constant so you know that v dot is if you take energy as your v then v dot is exactly zero therefore it's a stable system lagrange system is a stable system okay so this kind of a simple conclusion can be obtained all right